or good morning um, or good evening, depending on where you are tuning in from um, today. Um, so my name is Chisato Ito, and on behalf of the BEM TIG, Tobias Kot, Jess Roman, Toivo Glatz, and Megan Forrest, also M. Kemaya here today, um, I would like to welcome everyone to the October edition of the Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium. Um, we host these talks on the first Wednesday of each month and with guest speakers from Berlin and beyond, often um, internationally. And we also host a monthly journal club on the third Wednesday of the month. Um, and we have the uh, fall series starting um, very soon on October 19th. Um, today's presentation um, we will be recording and we'll make that available to you at a later day on our YouTube channel. And the presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. And so please feel free to post your questions using the uh, Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom window. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker, Daniel Westlake. Um, Daniel, he's a professor of epidemiology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's Galing School of Global Public Health. His research has focused on the intersection of HIV and reproductive health, the intersection of HIV and chronic diseases, as well as methods in causal in inference. He's an author of the textbook, Epidemiology by Design, a causal approach to the health sciences, which we had a pleasure of reading and discussing in our BEM book club this summer. He's also an author of the table two fallacy paper. If you haven't read this important paper yet, I would highly encourage you to have a read at this paper. Um, so today's talk is beyond um, internal validity, field notes from the methodological borderlands, and he will tell us about the causal impact framework and how it could provide a way to make epidemiologic findings more relevant to public policy and implementation science. Okay, um, please welcome Daniel, over to you. Thank you so much um, for that introduction and thank you all for having me today. Can everyone hear me all right? Can I get some thumbs up from the panel? Okay, thank you, Jess. Um, so yeah, so today I uh, am gonna be talking to you about the causal impact framework. Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge um, various uh, funding sources that have fed into this work over time and some of my collaborators on this work, though by no means all of them. Um, as usual, of course, uh, blame me and not them for any errors in what follows. So um, to jump into a motivating example, I want to start by talking about the number needed to treat, which is a fairly simple uh, epidemiologic idea, at least as we teach it, um, that often gets taught in the first semester of a methods class. I teach it in my own first semester methods class. Uh, and I'm sure most, or at least many of you are familiar with the number needed to treat, which is calculated as the inverse of the absolute value of the risk difference. So to make this a little bit more concrete, we're gonna go to a two by two table because that's how epidemiologists always make things more concrete. And suppose that we're looking at the effect of smoking on the five-year risk of some outcome, suppose say heart attack. Assume no confounding here that this two by two table accurately reflects reality, uh, in which we have 700 smokers uh, who have a five year risk of heart attack in this particular setting of 20%, and 1,300 non smokers who have a risk of 10%. Those risks can be back calculated from the table. The 10%, for example, is just 100, 130 over 1,300. And then you can use those two risks to calculate a risk difference of 20% minus 10% equals 10%. And uh, we would use that 10% typically to calculate a number needed to treat of 10, right? Just one over that 10%, indicating that if we can get 10 smokers to be non-smokers, we could prevent one heart attack over five years. Right? I think this is pretty familiar stuff to anyone who's taken a couple of epidemiology methods courses. Um, and this is the point where we might consider sort of feeding that number needed to treat forward into some kind of cost effectiveness model. But in any case, this is, this is probably the one line that makes it into our paper, right? Number needed to treat here is 10 over five years. Uh, there are some complications though. 
And uh, by way of motivating the rest of this talk, I wanna talk through a couple of those complications. The first complication is the complication of generalizability, right? So here's our data at the top. And now suppose that there is some effect measure modifier, Z, a dichotomous variable Z, uh, which it's not a confounder, right? As I'm demonstrating in this DAG below, but it does affect the risk of the outcome, which means that on some scale, at least, it's gonna be an effect measure modifier for this non-null association between smoking and heart attack. Um, I don't know if this is familiar abbreviation. MI stands for myocardial infarction in English um, for the non-native English speakers here, um, indicating heart attack. So sorry if that has not been clear. Um, and along those lines, uh, call out to me if I'm uh, using in, uh, English language colloquialisms that like don't entirely make sense to the audience. Um, somebody like tell me, okay? Um, <laughs> It's, uh, as a sidebar, this is a little bit of a tricky talk because, you know, epidemiologic methods are at least as much um, a verbal or semantic challenge as they are a quantitative challenge, right? So much of first semester epidemiology is not so much about getting the calculations right because the calculations are so easy. It's about expressing what those calculations mean unambiguously and accurately. And um, so it's complicated to be, um, a native English speaker speaking in English to an audience, which is mostly not native English speakers, at least I'm assuming. Um, so I'm probably making mistakes or assumptions here that don't apply, or I'm sort of making semantic leaps that people might not follow. So if that happens, please let me know and I'll try to, I'll try to explain. Um, anyway, suppose that in the general population, Z is a 50-50 variable, right? It's just, you know, it's uh, the probability that Z equals zero is 50%. The probability Z equals one is 50% in the general population. But in our study, we have oversampled Z equals zero. So 75% of our study is Z equals zero and only 25% is Z equals one. Further, uh, suppose that the risk, the absolute risks and the risk differences are higher in the Z equals one group, okay? And what that might look like is this, these stratum specific two by two tables. So in the Z equals zero group, 75% of the population sits here, a total of 1500 people out of the 2000 original people. 75% uh, of the people, but uh, only half of the events, right? And uh, instead of the risks of 20% and 10%, in this group, in the Z equals zero group, what we see is a risk of 13.3% and 6.7% for a risk difference of 6.7%. And in the Z equals one group, where only 500 total people sit, we see higher risks of 40% and 20% and a risk difference of 20%. A couple of things I want to point out here so people are tracking with me is that the original data, which is down in the corner, is just the sum of the two strata, right? 70 plus 70 gives us 140, 910 plus 260 gives us 1,170 and so on, right? So the other thing is that Z is a pure effect measure modifier rather than a confounder in the sense that it affects the overall risk of the outcome, but it does not affect in any way the probability of the exposure. The probability of the exposure is 35%, in both the Z equals zero and the Z equals one stratum, just as it was in the original data. Okay, that math, you can go back and, and look at this math later, I'm sure, but um, bear with me for the moment. So in this case, the risks are higher in the Z equals one group, and we have undersampled the Z equals one group. Right? We've undersampled the higher risk group. And this is the thing that happens all the time in our studies. For example, we typically undersample older adults into randomized trials. Right? It's very, very frequent. And I'll give you examples later on in this talk of how the people who participate in trials and the people who participate in studies in general often are not representative of the actual target populations we're most interested in thinking about. So this raises the question of what is the risk difference in the general population, right? Rather than just in our study where the risk difference is 
in the general population, it's pretty easy to calculate. Since the Z distribution is 50-50, we can just take an unweighted average of these two Z-specific risk differences. And what that would look like is this 20% risk difference times 0.5, plus our 6.7% risk difference times 0.5 yielding an overall expected risk difference in the general population of 13.3%, rather than the 10% we saw in our study sample. If the risk difference is 13.3%, then the NNT is 7.5 instead of 10. So now our interpretation has changed a little bit. Now we might say something like, if we are able to get 7.5 smokers to be non-smokers in the general population, we would expect to prevent one heart attack over five years, right? So this first complication points out that just the fact that you estimated something in your study sample does not necessarily mean that that is the number needed to treat or the risk difference that you should carry into, say, your cost-effectiveness model, right? Now, the second complication requires us to look at the thing we just said a little bit more deeply. We just said, if we were able to get 7.5 smokers to be non-smokers in the general population, we could prevent one heart attack over five years. And the question that then arises is, how do you get smokers to be non-smokers, right? The main way you do this is smoking cessation interventions or some kind of prevention modality where you prevent people from becoming smokers in the first place. But if we're thinking about active smokers, then what you've got is smoking cessation interventions. How effective are smoking cessation interventions? Well, it depends which one we're talking about, but say a combined nicotine replacement um, approach, which is like give people a nicotine patch and also give them gum or, uh, or nasal sprays so that they can avert um, immediate cravings as well as have a sort of nicotine drip coming into their body over time. A Cochrane review reports that that combined NRT approach is about 17.4% effective, right? Not actually very effective. It's, nicotine is a very tough problem. It's highly, highly addictive. And what that means is that you have to intervene on about one divided by 0.174 people, smokers, or about 5.75 smokers in order to get one person to quit smoking. Right? That's what that 17.4% effectiveness means. So going back again to how we usually frame the number needed to treat, if we were able to get 7.5 smokers to be non-smokers in the general population, there is no treatment in that statement. It's not a number needed to treat. It's imagining some magic wand that can, we can wave over smokers and get them to be non-smokers. But that's not how treatment works. Right? Treatment is something like the combination NRT. With that treatment, the number needed to treat is not 7.5. It's 7.5 inflated for the fact that our intervention is only 17% effective. So the actual number needed to treat here is something like if we treated 43 smokers in the general population with combination NRT, we would get 7.5 smokers to quit smoking and by so doing would expect to prevent one heart attack over five years, right? But that is not at all the way we report numbers needed to treat, right? Now we're like way off from how we sort of talk about numbers needed to treat commonly in the field. And of course, if we weren't intervening on smokers, but instead hoping people would see smoking because we've intervened in the whole population. Like if we took a public health rather than a medical approach, right? Um, I don't know how this works in Germany, but in the United States, there are taxes on cigarettes, right? And so if you raise those taxes, what you see is that some people will quit smoking. Not that many, right? Because again, smoking is very sticky, very addictive. But if you raise taxes, uh, it's sort of unclear how you would even calculate a number. Right, that's one intervention. So are you intervening on everybody as your denominator? Everybody is your denominator, just one single population. It's not totally clear how you would even calculate it, even though it could be an effective way to prevent heart attacks. And then there's this issue of side effects, 
which I call complication 2A. Suppose that this is our system, right? This is the system that we're thinking about here, in which we're concerned with the effect of smoking on heart attack, and we're interested, and you know, that whole system might be confounded by depression. And just assume that in our previous calculations, we were taking care of this confounded by depression. Now, the previous intervention that I that I put forward was combination NRT. And if you wanted to draw that intervention into your causal diagram, you might reasonably draw it into your diagram as an instrumental variable, right? I think many of us would anticipate the nicotine replacement therapy mostly just affects smoking, but it doesn't really affect the rest of the system directly. On the other hand, there are other ways to try to get people to quit smoking. For example, you could use cognitive behavioral therapy approaches, psychology approaches, counseling approaches to get people or to support people in quitting smoking, right? If you do that, you might actually affect people's depression as well as their smoking, right? Because counseling is helpful broadly for depression. Whether you focused on the depression or not, you might even, you might have some small but meaningful effect on the depression, you might not, but certainly you would not wanna draw cognitive behavioral therapy in the same way that you draw combination NRT onto your causal diagram because any therapy has the potential to affect your depression. And what this means is that even if cognitive behavioral therapy and combination NRT were equally as effective at getting you to quit smoking, right? Even if they both had a 17.4% effectiveness rate, then th therapy might have a bigger effect on your risk of heart attack because it's operating by multiple channels instead of the single channel that combination NRT is operating through. Right? Because there are side effects of that intervention that matter. And to reflect that, we would exactly draw it not as an instrumental variable, but rather more like something at the bottom of the screen here, where I've highlighted the causal pathways from therapy to MI in red. So if you want more and more detailed explanations of some of these points, um, you can look at my paper with uh, Steve Mooney from the University of Washington from a couple of years ago in epidemiology. But what I want to think about more broadly is that there can be a great distance between the standard number needed to treat, estimated about the effect of some exposure in some particular study sample, and the real number needed to treat that you would see in a target population with a real, not a magical, intervention and with possible side effects under real-world conditions. So this is true in randomized trials as well as in prospective observational cohort studies. And so this is all by way of introducing these two issues, and of course there are more than two issues, in interpreting standard study results as an estimate of the effect of some intervention under real world conditions. And these two issues, to call them out more broadly, are the question of internal versus external validity, and the question of exposures versus population interventions. So the first of these, very briefly, is simply that a trial or a well-conducted observational study will usually identify an internally valid sample average causal effect, sample as in the study sample. But we're rarely interested in the study sample for its own sake. And yet at the same time, it's very rare that we formally identify the target population. We almost never describe the target population in any detail. And yet, if the target population differs systematically from the study sample, the average causal effect in the study sample may not generalize unconditionally. So if our intervention is more effective in women than it is in men, and our study oversampled men and undersampled women compared to the target, which is another thing which is very common in randomized trials is to undersample women, then the average causal effect in the study is not gonna be equal in general to the average causal effect in the target. Sometimes it might be, but mostly you can't count on it. That's this first issue. And then the second issue is exposures versus interventions. Most non-experimental studies examine the effect of exposures like smoking rather than the effects of interventions like smoking cessation intervention. 
Many experimental studies examine the effect of high-end interventions under artificially controlled conditions rather than scalable interventions under real-world conditions. So the causal inference community is often focused on internal validity to the point where causal inference sometimes, uh, less than previously, but still often, can be taken as a synonym for internal validity. Right? What is causal inference? Well, it's the stuff you get out of a simple randomized trial, right? Is a common sort of first level perception of what is meant. And so in 2016, I and some colleagues put forward this framework that we called the causal impact framework about thinking beyond internal validity to help us have a greater impact on public health. And that framework is exactly what we've been going over, which is that we first think about internal validity, then we think about external validity, and then we think about population intervention estimation. So for the remainder of this talk, I'm gonna talk about these two sort of big ideas. First, this idea of external validity, and then the idea of population intervention. Again, I'm not going to have time to finish it all because I'm already 15 minutes into my 50 minutes, almost 20 minutes into my 50 minutes. But um, this is this is where we're heading. And if anyone is interested, I can talk more about it either in the questions or I can give you resources for more reading. It's also because I have to I can't give a talk like this without plugging my book anymore. Uh, this is also a little bit covered in chapter nine of the textbook in a very brief overview sort of way. So um, before I get to this point, are there any uh, questions so that people are sort of caught up to where I'm about to dive in more deeply into external validity? I don't see any questions submitted. Um, so I think we can go ahead, but um, I do Great. encourage people to just drop in questions into the Q&A as well. Great, thank you. So, I would argue that the modern causal approach to external validity started in the late 2000s. Um, Hernan et al. had a paper in epidemiology in 2008. Um, there were papers in clinical trials in 2009, one of them by Frankakis, I believe that was the commentary, um, gave us this quote. I just want to read the underlined bit for you, which says, randomized controlled trial results are useful only he said, only if we can calibrate the results to, protect, to predict treatment efficacy in the target population of interest. And that only is actually quite a strong statement, especially coming from a biostatistician, that the only utility of a randomized trial is in calibrating it, right, to a particular target population. Um, I think the, the sort of critical first real foray into using a quantitative approach to external validity was by Cole and Stewart in the American Journal of Epidemiology 2010. They presented a method using inverse probability weights to standardize clinical trial results to an external target population. Since then, there have been a sort of explosion of papers, including a bunch by Pearl and Berenboim, as well as others, uh, some by our group, including additional work by me and by Steve Cole and by Liz Stewart. I think what a lot of this works comes down to, uh, if you're not familiar with this work, it's very interesting, but it's not actually that complicated. Because what a lot of it comes down to is basically the principles of survey sample weighting. And so in particular, the idea oftentimes is that if, you, if you're interested in understanding something about all of Germany and you run a clinical trial only in Berlin, you might be worried that the people in Berlin are not representative of everyone in Germany. And so you can treat the people in Berlin as if they are a sample of all of the people in Germany and post hoc try to figure out what sampling weights would weight the people in Berlin to represent the entire population of Germany, right? Now, if you were doing survey sampling, in the first place, you would know what those weights are because you would have designed the survey in a particular way to know those weights. In this setting, you're doing it after the fact and you have to rely on assumptions about getting every important variable. 
But aside from the fact that the weights are estimated, they're very, very similar to survey sampling weights in a lot of different ways. So to give another example, suppose in a randomized trial with full compliance and no missing data, that the causal effect of a treatment on the outcome is a risk difference of 10% in HIV negative women and then 20% in HIV positive women. And our study is 50% HIV positive because we oversampled HIV positive women into the study, which is a thing you would do if you were running an HIV cohort of some kind, right? So the risk difference in that population the 50-50 population would likely be 15%. But the risk difference in that population, in the target population, where only 10% of the women are HIV positive would be quite different, right? Now, if it were just HIV, which is typically gonna be measured, we could adjust, right? We could, uh, we could do the standardization of those risk differences to any arbitrary population distribution of HIV positivity. But what if the heterogeneity turned not on HIV, but rather on some unmeasured genetic marker that we overrepresented in our study and didn't even know existed, right? Some drug only works in people with some particular genetic marker and our study oversampled those people, same, right? Then we're a little bit out of luck. And in fact, as I'm gonna go over several slides from now, we're in a situation which is highly analogous to a situation in which we have an unmeasured genome. It's the same sort of exchangeability challenge for causal inference purposes that you would see if you had unmeasured or uncontrolled confounding. The, maybe the larger problem, though, is one of target populations. So Maldonado and Greenland have a paper in the International Journal of Epidemiology 2002 where they establish pretty compellingly that no causal effect is defined without a specified target population. Usually in a trial or in an observational study, the target population is not explicitly identified, right? Nobody is saying in most papers, we're estimating a, we're estimating a causal effect and our target population is X. So in those cases, what is the target population? I think that there are three main implicit alternatives for what the target population is when a paper doesn't tell you what the target population is, right? The first is the study sample itself, right? That's the first sort of possibility. I'm, I'm, my target is exactly the people I'm studying and no one else. The second possibility is the superpopulation implied by table one, right? That is the population for which table one represents a simple random sample. Another way to think about that is like table one times 1,000. That's our target population. And then the third possibility, I think, is that the target population for the study, especially for a trial, is the population defined by the inclusion and exclusion criteria of that study or trial, right? That's what defines who the target is. So these are sort of the three, I think, implicit target populations for papers that don't actually tell you what their target population is. I don't think any of these are right uh, in general for most randomized trials and most observational studies. Some of these may be true in really large scale community randomized trials or pragmatic trials. If you're randomizing 300,000 people in Western Kenya, it might well be that you are sort of, your target population is everybody who's defined by your inclusion and exclusion criteria. But in general, for sort of traditional randomized trials, I don't think any of these are very likely. To take them in backwards order, is your target population defined by the inclusion and exclusion criteria? Well, inclusion and exclusion criteria for a trial often reflect risk enrichment. Right? When you're constructing a trial, you often deliberately oversample high-risk people in order to increase power. Uh, and sometimes you select people to sort of anti-enrich for comorbidities, right? So your ideal trial population is often people at very high risk of the outcome, but particularly low risk of side effects and of comorbidities. And right there already, that's probably not your whole target population. 
How about the superpopulation for table one? Well, we rarely want to generalize only to those people who, if we had approached them, would have consented to be in our trial. But that's what table one is for most randomized trials. It's the people who agreed, right? The other thing is that trials sometimes, indeed often, recruit people with greater health-seeking behaviors and people who are more adherent than typical members of the true target population. So there as well, just saying sort of your table one times a thousand is probably not who your superpopulation, who your true target population really is. What about the study sample itself? Well, there are a couple problems with considering the study sample itself to be your target population. First is the question of time. You're doing a study now, but you're making decisions about what to do in that population later. And so even if you're talking about the same people, you're talking about those people at a different time, a different time of year, years later, at different ages than they were when you started the study. And so in a technical sense, the study sample itself is probably not your target population. Now, those changes might be very small and they might not matter. But I think what's more central, a challenge to this claim that the study sample itself is the target population, is this ethical question. So here I'm going to be quoting um, US regulations. I do not know what the equivalent regulations are in Germany. But in general, studying human beings uh, creates risk to those human beings. And those risks are justified because of the benefits claimed, you know, that you, you claim are going to come out of the study of the people, right? And so you're doing research. Often what you're claiming to produce is generalized knowledge or generalizable knowledge, right? And so Boston University, for example, defines generalizable knowledge as uh, scientific theories or hypotheses or conclusions that are intended to be applicable or shared beyond the populations or situations being studied. And that's a pretty common understanding of what you're doing when you do science, right? You're very specifically not trying to only learn things most of the time about the thousand people who happen to be in your trial, right? What you're trying to do is learn something from those thousand people that applies beyond the people in the trial. That's what justifies, in a certain sense, the risks of the study that you're doing on those thousand people. And so to the extent that this is true, you actually have an ethical obligation right, to generalize your work beyond the study sample. And so you've implicitly promised the Human Subjects Review Board, the Ethics Oversight Committee, you have promised them implicitly that the study sample is not actually the target population, right? So every time somebody makes that claim, every time somebody makes the claim that the study sample is the target population, they are almost certainly running up against a real ethical in terms of the risks versus the benefits of the work. Uh, here, I just want to take a moment and say that there are two kinds of external validity questions um, that uh, we run up against in the literature, and they have slightly different language attached to them in the current literature. So. Sometimes the study sample is a proper subset of the target population, right? So you do a randomized trial in Berlin and your target population is everyone in Berlin or everyone in Germany. And then sometimes it, the study sample is not a proper subset. So you do a study in Berlin and your target population is Paris, right? So when the study sample is a subset, a proper subset of the target population, the literature calls this case generalizability. And when the study sample is at least partially external to the target population, like Berlin to Paris, we call that a problem of transportability, right? Now, these are treated as very separate kinds of problems by some of the literature. Judea Pearl, in particular, treats them as completely different problem sets. I, uh, I have also treated them as different problems. I don't think they have to be different different problems and different methodological approaches. 
but I haven't really had those opinions peer reviewed yet. And I will add that it is always a very uh, fraught and tricky thing to disagree with Judea Pearl on a subject of methodology. So I'm saying that I think you can probably treat them very similarly and that the differences are not all that big, but I'm only saying that with like 30% confidence, okay? We can think about why the internally valid estimate of a causal effect estimated in a trial might differ from the effect estimated in some target population. Like we can think about this question of why something might fail to be externally valid in a particular case uh, using causal diagrams in the same way that we think about causal inference in internal validity. So let's take a what if of studying pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV prevention, PrEP, um, in which the study sample includes more people who are highly adherent to treatment, right? This example is drawn from a paper, a commentary that I wrote with um, Jesse Edwards, who's faculty at UNC Chapel Hill and an excellent methodologist. So normally when we draw a causal diagram like this, we would just start with our exposure and our outcome. Uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis and its effect on HIV is the thing we're interested in. Here, we're going to expand this as our first step to include a mediator of that effect, because this mediator is, in fact, sort of entirely mediates this effect. The way PrEP works, the way pre-exposure prophylaxis using antiretroviral therapy works to prevent HIV is that it puts active drug concentration into your body. If it fails to do that for some reason, it can't have any causal effect on HIV acquisition in general. I would believe that there's maybe a 1% some other pathway that's happening here, but effectively the entire effect of pre-exposure prophylaxis on HIV is mediated by actually getting the drug into your body. The reason to draw this mediating node is that there's another thing that points into it, which is your adherence. Right. One thing to call out in this causal diagram is that there's a structural interaction here. If adherence is zero, then there should be no causal effect of pre-exposure prophylaxis versus placebo on HIV. Right. It doesn't matter if I'm giving you tenofovir or placebo or sugar pill, a placebo, if you're not taking the pill that I give you. Right. So if your adherence is zero, there should be no causal effect of PrEP. If you have a placebo pill, then it doesn't matter what your adherence is. There should be no causal effect on HIV there either, right? Because there's no way to have active drug concentration in your blood from just a placebo. Now, there are all sorts of ways this could go wrong, of course, right? You could have crossover. You could have people lying about what they're doing in the actual data analysis. You could have measurement error of various types, but in general, you have a structural interaction here. What's nice about that is it gives you leverage on modeling assumptions, right? If you're seeing, for example, among people who have an adherence of zero, if you're seeing a causal effect of, of pre-exposure prophylaxis, even when adherence is zero, you, you have some kind of a problem. I don't know what that problem is, right? I can't diagnose it for you, but you know something is weird because there, if you're literally not taking the pill, it doesn't matter what I assign you to take. Um, in the States, there's this, uh, this phrase called Coop's axiom named after the former Surgeon General of the United States, C. Everett Coop. Coop said drugs don't work in patients who don't take them, All right? So this is a nice example of that. Of course, Coop's axiom is not true whenever you're dealing with an infectious disease because my vaccine can protect you from getting the flu, right? So the drug that I took works in somebody who didn't take the drug. So adherence is affected probably by health-seeking behaviors. People who floss their teeth every day and go to the dentist all the time, they probably are more adherent to their drugs. Those people also probably wear condoms more Right? There's a whole cluster of sort of healthier, health-seeking behaviors. And so it's pretty reasonable to draw this health-seeking node with an arrow into adherence. 
which then affects active drug concentration and a separate arrow into HIV. If at this point, we oversample into our study people who are health seeking, which is a common thing for a randomized trial to do. We now have an open pathway between selection into our study, this S equals one, and the outcome of HIV. And this is a sufficient condition in causal diagram land for us to worry that our internally measured effect of pre-exposure prophylaxis on HIV is not going to apply to the general population, which is to say unconditional on our S equals one node, right? S equals one indicating again, of the entire population, S equals one are the people who were selected into our study. And so what we're actually interested in here is this entire causal effect unconditional on S. And again, in the usual causal diagram way that we would analyze an open backdoor path between our exposure and our outcome to determine this question of confounding and exchangeability, we have the same thing for external validity, where an open backdoor path between S and the outcome indicates a potential lack of exchangeability between the S equals one group and the whole group unconditional on S. We also might suppose that there's a node heading from PrEP to adherence, because if you know that you're getting the real thing, you're probably gonna be more adherent. But with blinding or masking, as you might have with a placebo in a randomized trial and assuming no side effects of PrEP, you could erase that arrow. So, this is a way to think through this question of external validity using causal diagrams. This is almost identical to the way we think about missing data with causal diagrams, right? And you can really think of this as just a missing data problem. We have data when S equals one, right? When you're in my study sample, and we want inference unconditional on S or po possibly only in S equals zero. Rion Daniel, who is a uh, faculty at, I believe, the University of Wales or at a Welsh university, uh, in any case, had a paper in um, the journal SMMR in 2012, showing that we can estimate unbiased causal effects unconditional on missingness when we have conditional independence of missingness, which in this case is identical to sampling, and the outcome. Additional work by Pearl and Berenboim and others also take this approach explicitly for transportability. Hernan addresses similar issues in a recent commentary in AJE. And so really you can just think of all of this as a kind of missing data problem, right? We have data on S equals one, we want the rest of the data. Because we're now talking about causal approaches and causal diagrams, you might suspect that identification conditions are gonna come up for these questions of external validity, and they do, right? So instead of exchangeability uh, for internal validity, right, which is a word that we use as one of our causal identification conditions, Hernan and Robin's causal inference book talk through it quite extensively, this condition of exchangeability, we have an external exchangeability, <clears throat> right? And so, in the way that internal exchangeability is really about like no confounding and no selection bias, external exchangeability is really about no effect measure modification. That the people we observe don't have a different distribution of effect measure modifiers than the people we don't observe. And instead of positivity, which you probably recall from discussions of internal validity causal inference, we have a transport or an external equivalent condition, right? In particular, if you have a bunch of 70-year-old women in the target population, but you don't have any women over age 50 in your study sample, you can't estimate the effects in the 70-year-olds in your target population because you have no data there, right? Unless you extrapolate your models, which is exactly how you overcome non-positivity in an internal context. 
so these, this is talked about in a paper that was first authored by Katie Lesko, who's faculty at Johns Hopkins and is an excellent methodologist as well in the journal Epidemiology in 2017. Uh, there should be an et al. after Westreich. There are a whole bunch of us on this paper. I apologize to the other co-authors for that. And then Hernan and Vanderweel have a paper in 2011 pointing out that when you want to transport results, you need similar versions of treatment in the study sample and target population, which you can think of as a sort of transport or external equivalent to the consistency assumption for causal inference. And so if people are taking a lot of different uh, are getting their interventions in a bunch of different ways inside your study sample, then you need the same distribution of those ways in your target population. The other way to think through this problem, though, is to think about the case in which a study sample is a random sample of the target population. So when the study sample is a simple random sample of the target population, you get this kind of external exchangeability condition because the distribution of effect measure modifiers should be the same in your study sample as it is in the whole target population, right? That's what the simple random sampling should give you. You on average will get positivity because all patterns of data that are in your target population ought to be represented in your study sample, right? On average, in a large enough sample, you'll get every pattern that you need and so on, right? The pattern of the interventions, the consistency assumption ought to be met in expectation through simple random sampling, right? Now, in reality, we can essentially never do a simple random sample from a target population to establish our, um, our study sample, but it's a useful, I think, thought experiment in illustrating how and why these causal identification conditions apply to moving from a study sample to a target population, just like randomization of treatment assignment is a useful thought experiment when thinking about the causal identification conditions in an observational setting. Let me... Um, Yeah, I'm extremely short on time. So <laughs> maybe I'm just going to have to come back to talk about the rest of this at some point, or maybe you can all ask me questions. But I, I'm going to, I guess the last thing I'm going to say is that I think that external validity is a really, really common problem in the literature. Uh, we don't really know how common because people are not looking at this problem in depth. But when we do look, we, we sort of have good mathematical reasons to think so. And we have sort of, when people look, we often see a lack of representativeness in our studies. So I'm just gonna leave you with this simple piece of math and then jump to my conclusions and the pictures of my kids that are always at the end of every one of my presentations, which is to say that when baseline risks change, we can expect effect measure modification on at least one scale. This is a thing that I cover in my book, but we know that for a non-null effect, a change in the baseline risk of the outcome necessitates mathematically effect measure modification on at least one scale. And so if you think about a situation in which you have a baseline risk of 5% and an exposed risk of 10%, you have a risk difference of 5% and a risk ratio of two. If your baseline risk shifts to 10%, you can have the same risk difference, but then you have a different risk ratio or you can have the same risk ratio, but then you have a different risk difference, right? And so I'm gonna skip past this pretty quickly, but the point is that when you have a non-null causal effect and a change in the baseline risk of the outcome, you mathematically must have effect measure modification on at least one scale. And the thing is that nearly all randomized trials misrepresent the baseline risk in the target population. Most often, randomized trials will oversample individuals at high risk of the outcome in order to increase study power. For example, in HIV context, we often oversample serodiscordant couples, couples in which one person has HIV and the other doesn't, in order to ensure some amount of exposure to HIV in every HIV uninfected person in the study. In reality, most HIV negative people never come into con sexual contact with someone who has HIV. 
right? So ensuring that everyone is exposed is a way of artificially raising the baseline risk of the outcome in that population. Same thing is true of studies in CVD context and in almost every context. What this means is that most randomized trials are not going to be generalizable to the intended target population on at least one scale. And so here, I'm going to address this Q&A question, which was the question, uh, for those who are not reading it, is that in the example I used risk difference as an effect measure, is there an effect measure that you believe to be more transportable? Often it is argued that risk ratios conditional on the effect modifier are more transportable than risk differences. I have never seen an empirical argument making the case that ratio measures are more transportable. It may exist, but the only things that I have seen in the literature on that point are people saying, in my experience, I've looked at a lot of papers and risk ratios look like they are more transportable. Or I looked at effect measure modification on the risk ratio scale, and I don't see risk, I don't see a lot of effect measure modification of the risk ratio. The only arguments I see really or have seen really about risk ratios supposedly or odd ratios or some ratio measures in general being more transportable from one situation to another, those arguments seem to not be particularly empirical. They seem to be basically anecdotal at scale. I've looked at a lot of papers and it doesn't look that way to me is what those arguments often boil down to. That's not evidence. Um, those people may be right. Uh, that risk ratios are more generally transportable than risk differences. It's entirely possible. I don't know of a solid empirical basis for making that argument, though. Um, so I think that there is a there is a methodology. I, that's not entirely true. I have some ideas, but they're like not very well fleshed out <laughs> as to how you would try to make that case empirically and in a sort of rigorous evidence-based way. But I don't think the case has been made yet. And until it's made, I don't really know what to think of those claims, except that they strike me mostly as um, beliefs based on like real experience, but quite possibly clouded by various cognitive biases. Right? People believe a lot of things based on their own experiences that are just not empirically the case. So maybe those things are empirically the case, maybe they're not, but I, I have not been convinced yet by what I've seen on that count. Um, so this is a good place to stop. I wrote a sonnet uh, about um, transportability that I'm just going to leave up on the screen for like 10 more seconds so that it's in the recording and you can go back and read it later if you want to. I read a lot of sonnets about epidemiologic methods, eventually hoping to uh, write a book that's going to be titled Epidemiology for Poets. I'm happy to talk about that later if you want. Uh, for those real poetry nerds in the crowd, this is a modified Pushkin sonnet the way Pushkin used in Eugene Onyegin, his novel in verse, except this is iambic pentameter, whereas Pushkin used iambic uh, tetrameter. So now I'm going to skip all the way to the end um, and just point out that this approach, this idea of the causal impact framework of uh, thinking about internal validity and then external validity and then population intervention impact can require work across disciplines uh, in very useful ways, right? Trials often are more typically the domain of biostatistics than epidemiology, but external validity is almost always observational data analysis. So even if there's a biostatistician running the trial, the transport or the generalization from internal to external validity is a question that requires epidemiologic methods and thinking in much the same ways that observational data analysis traditionally does. And then the population intervention effect estimation part, where we say, well, it's not smoking that we're interested in. What we're really interested in is interventions against smoking. That discussion can benefit enormously from the, in, uh, the input of health behavior experts who can help you identify what interventions you would actually want to do and how effective they are, and health policy experts who can tell you what they actually want to study the cost effectiveness of. Um, and so um, my argument 
summarized uh, with not nearly enough time, is that to maximize the utility of biostatistics and epidemiology to the world, we can think beyond internal validity and think further into external validity and target validity and population intervention impact. We can uh, shift into the question and answer.